Good morning to you and thank you so much for finding time to being with us today. I'd like to bring us the latest news headlines from across the continent of Africa and as usual we shall start with the newspapers from Kenya. The standard newspaper Hidden Hand in Jubilee Takeover beat rattles Uhuru. Former President Uhuru Kenyatta yesterday railed at police and the government over moves to as uh, power. A jubilee party through the back door, he called for respect and adherence to the rule of law. A story is uh, inside the standard newspaper. The fate of 1.3 billion Kenya shillings water projects angers Mount Kenya and investors dump Kenya dollar bonds. Children Bob Brandt of Carlt. I think yesterday five bodies of uh, children are retrieved from this ongoing uh, fasting saga or cult. Millers given seven days to prove grain uh, imports. The Star newspaper. Kenyatta back to reclaim Jubilee. We don't need to be pushed by police. We will peacefully make our decisions. The story is on page six. The Daily Nation, you slept on the job, MPs tell Trio. And I think a uh, director of criminal investigations are being accused. And uh, Major General Philip Kamaru and uh, IG, that is Inspector of Police, uh, Kome. I uh, think the MPs are debating uh, this unfortunate incident, even as more bodies continue to be recovered. And they're saying this... Uh, government offices as uh, someone slept on the job there uhuru joins fight for jubilee so the people daily uhuru fights off jubilee rebels that's what we have there and the business daily wealthy kenyans stash nearly one trillion kenya shillings in dollar accounts and the taifa leo uhuru atolea ruto kucha <laughs> okay and then dci this is also Tefalia. Yeah. DCI Wahoji, Pastor Ezekiel. Uh, okay. Very well. And then we go to other uh, newspapers from across the continent. Let me see. Uh, the Daily News from Zimbabwe. Opposition faces uh, Wanras 2023 polls as analysts say vote remains ZANU PF to lose. Uh, that sounds like something I read yesterday. Okay, I don't think I have um, the African, the, other, the rest of the African papers, but let me take us through the, the UK newspapers. Health warning over popular weight loss drugs sold illegally on Facebook. And the independent Iraq war hero don't deport brave Afghan pilot to Rwanda. The Daily Record scores a Shan King's coronation. Almost three quarters of people in Scotland don't care about crowning of a new monarch. Times are changing now. The Guardian concerns raised over Buckley's conduct towards civil servants. The Times as well from the UK. What married men will never admit. I'm curious to know that. And post-scandal victims die without getting payouts. The Daily Telegraph. Architect of Hong Kong crackdown to attend coronation. The Daily Mail, invitations to put you off your coronation gish, I guess, whatever that is. And then the newspapers from um, the US. US today, new border rules could still be hard on migrants. College scoring tool gets an update and babies from skin cells, it could happen. And some fear end of the Title 42 will bring fresh area of obstacles. The New York Times in India, it's their turn for big league dreams. I think in cric uh, cricket, you know, India and Pakistan and those Asian countries are really, really, that's, they dominate the cricket world. So that is what they are talking about there. Carlson's text ignite a crisis for Fox Chiefs and House approves a debt ceiling bill setting up clash. Uh, in vivid detail, Trump accuser tells her story. Uh, former president is having numerous uh, cases in court, and one of them is uh, a rape case. So that is also what they're talking about there, and the case is ongoing. UK blocks Microsoft's accusation of activation. And when DeSantis took on the mouse, it roared. 
And then new stay as well from the U.S. Uh, Biden enters the race, potential 2024 rematch with GOP frontrunner Trump takes shape. What to know about the declared candidates so far? And of course, uh, Harry Belafonte, iconic singer, actor, and activist who died at the age of 96. The Washington Post, U.S. drifts toward Cliff as debt ceiling, Bill passes house, and Carol Trump raped her, shattered reputation. And Russia can fund war for a year despite sanctions. And then Disney alleging political uh, retali retaliation and sues DeSantis. DeSantis is the governor for Florida, and he's been on a tussle with Disney, you know, uh, the Disney World. They're there in Miami, Florida, and it's been a, uh, they've not been agreeing on certain social issues. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, I see I do have some from across the continent. The Herald from uh, Zimbabwe. Science can't leapfrog Africa's development. Continent's future lies in innovation. I think this this is the way to go. And should Africa really want to uh, be any better and be competitive in this current world, I think it is about time we embraced science and we embraced innovation. Like, for instance, here in Kenya, we do have a whole university, well-respected and well-equipped with everything it needs, Jomo Kenyatta University of Science and Technology. And yet, we, we still can't have, and it produces graduates every year. Jomo Kenyatta University of, I think, Agriculture Science, or something like that, j -Quad. And still, we, we can't uh, we, we can't we can't have our 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 uh, you know the students that reproduce graduates that reproduce from these uh, you know institutions to uh, lead in terms of uh, engaging and and seeing how can we uh, you know push our innovation towards um, the next level we do have institutions also like Egerton and others that offer uh, agriculture and all these courses very well uh, you know, done and all that. And then we're, we're still here struggling with full security. Why do they go to learn all this? Why, what is the purpose of seeking knowledge if you can't use it to, uh, to try to, to make a difference in a life? We just don't go seeking for knowledge for the sake of seeking for knowledge or creating these courses for the sake of just creating them. These are courses that, and knowledge that we could really use these brains to help us in solving these problems we keep uh, grappling with. I think it's about time, really. So I totally do agree uh, with this heading. If we are sitting here waiting for somebody to come save us, Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine is in the middle of a, a war, and Ukraine can still afford to give us food, to, uh, food aid. Can you imagine that? It is shameful. And not because Africa is not able to feed itself. Matter of fact, the leading arable lands that sits idle in the world, according to statistics, is found in Africa. Arable land. Forget the, the deserts in the different countries. A lot of arable lands that sits uh, you know, idle around the world is found in, in Africa. So if we could just focus, we could have leaders and not politicians, but leaders who are serious about addressing the issues of the people and solving these problems, that it's, it's shameful. It's very shameful that we still can't feed ourselves. And yet we have the potential, and yet we have everything that we need. We have the good weather, we have the good soil. We have uh, uh, the labor even for that. Africans are very hardworking. Instead, we're having our young people dying in the Mediterranean, trying to access other parts of the world that they're not even wanted to see if they could uh, be fed and they can have a better life. It is a shame. So Africa should start engaging seriously on matters, science and technology, and see how can we incorporate that in the sectors, in key sectors uh, in our countries. How can we accelerate manufacturing? How can we support that? How can we use technology and innovation to support our agricultural uh, sector? Because that is the backbone in, for most of our uh, countries in Africa. And yet, like in Kenya, I, I grew up hearing that and still is, you know, that is the back, we, we hear every now and then that is the backbone of the Kenyan economy. Now, if that is the backbone of our economy, 
then we have a problem. No wonder the architecture of our country has a problem. Because the backbone is not working. We are not strategic. We are not, we don't do things right. We are not doing enough to support the Kenyan farmer or the, the rest of the African farmers. So we, we have to stop with the, with the talk, with, you know, this we keep talking and nothing is being done and see how can we truly engage and in a manner that uh, can make a difference to the people of this continent. So I completely agree. And these meetings they keep having. Um, and of course, on the photo there, I think I see President Kagame, I see President uh, uh, of Zimbabwe, of course, and I also see uh, the President of Malawi, and I also see the President of um, Zambia here, you know, and that other one, I can't remember. But they're at the end, I think they were having a, a meeting, and now they uh, feel that it's about time science can leap, leapfrog Africa's development and continent's future lies in innovation. And that is the whole truth. And until we are able to embrace innovation and embrace science and use it for our own good, then it's, uh, you know, we'll keep lining up in the airports and the seaports waiting for aid food to come from countries that should not even be feeding us. Okay, what a shame. The Daily News, more misery for poor consumers as some retailers price goods exclusively in US dollars. That is in Zimbabwe. 3K TV will air more top Korean shows. Mm. This day from Nigeria, again, Tinubu meets APC, NWC, National Assembly members of a 10th legislature's leadership. The nation, Tinubu, APC, target consensus Senate president, speaker. The punch, Sudan conflict, students lament slow evacuation, federal government to pay 1.2 million US dollars. For that, the citizen from Tanzania revealed women CEOs driving growth in Africa. And the new vision, subjects for primary school to be reviewed. Okay. Daily Monitor from Uganda as well. US targets AIDS, cash cut over anti-gay law. <laughs> All right, I guess that is a war that um, Seven is ready to take on. But, you know, I was talking to us here, was it on Ma Monday or Tuesday? And President Seven was supposed to have signed that bill over the weekend, but he sent it back. Apparently, he had not looked entirely at some of the clauses. And I think there's one of them that I said that still was going to penalize people who have agreed to, I guess, repent or, I, I don't know, something like that. And so he sent it back for the legislators to look at it again and perhaps make it more easier for people who want to uh, turn back their ways <laughs> and stop being homosexuals, I, I guess. And so they can be, according to that bill, they can be allowed to, to get help without... Um, without being penalized it's interesting okay all right let's leave that alone let's just get into the latest uh, from across the continent those were the headlines from across africa the uk and the us you are now up to date now fighting uh, is still flaring up in Sudan as Sudan's army and paramilitary force battled on Khartoum's outskirts on Wednesday Undermining a truce in the 11-day conflict, but the army expressed willingness to extend the ceasefire. The army later on Wednesday said its leader, General Abdel Fattah al-Buran, gave initial approval to a plan to extend the truce for another 72 hours and send an army envoy to the South Sudan capital, Juba, for talks. The Sudanese armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces previously agreed to a three-day ceasefire that is to expire late Thursday. There has no immediate response. There was no immediate response from the RSF to the proposal from the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, a regional bloc. The military said the presidents of South Sudan, Kenya and Djibouti worked on a proposal that includes extending the truce and talks between the two forces. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and the African Union Commission Chairperson Musa Mohamed Faki discussed working together to create a sustainable end to the fighting and uh, the State Department said in a statement on Tuesday. 
Some of Wednesday's heaviest battles were in Omdurman, a city adjoining Khartoum, where the army was fighting RSF reinforcements from other regions of Sudan. A Reuters reporter said heavy gunfire and airstrikes could be heard into the evening in Khartoum, which together with two bordering cities is one of the Africa's largest urban areas. Gangs marauded and there was widespread looting. Since fighting erupted in April 15th, airstrikes and artillery have killed at least 512 people and wounded nearly now topping over 4,200, destroyed hospitals and limited food distribution in the first nation where a third of the 46 million people relied on humanitarian aids and the World Health Organization said 16% of health facilities were functioning, were functioning in Khartoum and predicted many more deaths from diseases and shortages of food, water and medical services including immunization. The treatment of an estimated 50,000 acutely malnourished children has been disrupted by the conflict and the hospitals that are still functioning are facing shortages of medical supplies, power and water. That is according to a United Nations update on Wednesday. And deadly clashes broke out in Jenaina, a West Darfur on Tuesday and Wednesday, resulting in looting and civilian deaths and raising concerns about an escalation of ethnic tensions. The update said the crisis has sent growing numbers of refugees across Sudan's borders with the United Nations Refugee Agency estimating about 270,000 people could flee into Sudan, into South Sudan and Chad alone. And the World Health Organization said on Wednesday it was assessing the threat posed to public health after fighters in Sudan occupied a national laboratory holding samples of deadly diseases. And the World Health Organization's chief Tedros, uh, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said that they were concerned that those occupying the lab could be, could be accidentally exposed to pathogens stored in there. He was speaking in Geneva during a press conference and World WHO is seeking more information and conducting a risk assessment. In his comments, uh, his comments came a day into a 72-hour ceasefire that was struggling to hold after the regular army launched renewed airstrikes against rival paramilitary forces in the capital, Khartoum. The nearly two weeks of urban combat has killed hundreds and wounded thousands and sparked a mass exodus of foreigners, while the UN has warned a giant new refugee crisis could be brewing. On Tuesday, World Health Organization's representative in Sudan, Nima Saeed Abid, told reporters that the seizure of the laboratory had created an extremely, extremely dangerous situation. And she said there is a huge biological risk associated with the occupation of the Central Public Health Lab. Olivier Lee Pauline. WHO's incident manager for Sudan response told reporters on Wednesday that the lab held samples of pathogens including measles, tuberculosis, cholera, polio, SARS, COV2, which causes COVID-19 diseases. Sudan's Central Commission of Medical Laboratory said on Wednesday that the fighters were using the lab as a base, warning that targeting them could lead to health and environmental catastrophe with unimaginable consequences. WHO Emergency Director Michael Ryan said the main risk was likely to any untrained people in the lab who could accidentally expose themselves to the pathogens. And South Sudan on Tuesday confirmed receiving more than 10,000 civilians displaced by the ongoing conflict in the neighboring Sudan. South Sudan's Interim Minister of Foreign Affairs and the International Corporation Deng Dang Deng said the majority of the returnees are the country's nationals, where others include Sudanese, Kenyans, Ugandans, Eritreans, and Somalis. He disclosed hundreds of other civilians have arrived in northern and western Bala el Ghazal and states, respectively, being said. And Deng said the South Sudanese government has opened its airspace for countries evacuating their diplomats and nationals. He said 24 Kenyan nationals who arrived in, from Sudan through the northern border from Paloch Airport in northern, in Upper Nile State, were evacuated on Monday to Juba. This came after Abdel Fattah al Buran, the head of the Sudanese Armed Forces, and his rival Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, the lead of the paramilitary rapid support forces, reached a three day ceasefire deal. 
We head over to Senegal and eight veteran Senegalese riflemen will be finally returning home for good this Friday after President Emmanuel Macron's government in January lifted a six-month residency condition for their military pension. Hundreds of thousands of African soldiers fought for France in the two world wars and against independence movements in Indochina and Algeria. But until this year, surviving veterans among the so-called Senegalese infantrymen had to live in France for half the year or lose their pension. In January, the French state uh, dropped the condition saying they could return home for good and continue receiving their monthly allowance of 950 euros. Uh, it could also pay for the flight and move of any veteran wishing to leave, but for most, it is too late. Only a few dozens of the former riflemen are still alive, and some of them are too frail to return home. Their pensions were increased to adjust the inflation for the first time since 2006, after almost five decades only, after years of lobbying where they, finally, they were finally granted French nationalities in 2017 by the then President François Hollande. Another victory for these old men who will return home on Friday where they can finally live in peace surrounded by their families. You mean they can die in peace? Because when you do, these are people who fought in the World War <laughs> Two that ended in 1945. So how old are these people really? But I guess that's a, that's a good news there. And the latest are on the fight uh, in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo as the M23 rebels have been withdrawing from occupied villages and towns in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, East African Community Regional Force EACRF Commander Major General Jeff Nyaga says he is pleased with the positive progress in the withdrawal process. In 2022, East African member countries established a regional force to end the activism of armed groups in eastern DRC, including the M23 rebels. According to Major General Nyaga, these withdrawals followed the deployment of several contingents of the EACRF who took control after the rebels agreed to leave their positions in accordance with the roadmaps agreed to by the regional heads of states. In the Rushuru a territory about 100 kilometers from Goma, the capital of North Kivu province, Ugandan troops under the mission of the EACRF had since late March taken over strategic town of Bunagana, bordering Uganda that was formerly occupied by the M23. The fall of the multiple localities to the hands of the rebels increased the economic pressure on the population of Goma and its surroundings as main roads in the region have been interrupted, causing a shortage of food and basic necessities. During a press conference last week in the DRC, capital Kinshasa, the country's president Felix Tshisekedi reaffirmed his position not to open dialogue with the M23 rebels. M23 political wing head Bertrand Basimwa also rejected the containment of his elements without a direct dialogue with Kinshasa. However, Major General Nyaga is reassuring that the progress of the peace process on the ground remains positive and would lead to a definitive resolution to this crisis, in particularly the continuation of talks with the M23 rebel, uh, rebels at the regional level. To reassure that life returns to normal in the region, ESCRF troops deployed on the Goma Bunagana Road Junction, a principal lifeline uh, for local residents, are currently working to secure the traffic of small traders who supply the city of Goma with food products. Um, and that is according to media reports on the ground. And then uh, Rwanda's President Paul Kagame is scheduled to arrive in Tanzania on Thursday, that is today for a two-day uh, meeting during which he will meet with the country's president, Samia Suluhu Hassan. Kagame and his delegation will be welcomed at the Julius Nyerere International Airport in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania uh, by Tanzania's Foreign Affairs and East African Cooperation Minister, Ster Gomena Tax. The two leaders will hold talks later in the day at the country's state house. President Kagame will depart from Tanzania on Friday. The ministry did not disclose any particular agenda for the presidential talks, but Kagame's visit comes amid simmering tensions between Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, both of which share borders with Tanzania. Also likely to come up during the discussions are reported talks, peace talks, 
between Ethiopia's federal government and the rebel Oromo Liberation Army in Tanzania, Zanzibar, Archipelago. The AP News Agency quoted a spokesperson for the rebel group saying the preliminary peace talks with Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed initially announced last Sunday formally kicked off in Zanzibar on Tuesday. And families of Tunisian political leaders chilled in a growing government crackdown have petitioned the European Union to impose sanctions on the president, Kaye Said, and his ministers. A formal request has been submitted on behalf of prominent opposition figures, including the parliament speaker and leader of the Enhada party, Rashid Ganucci, and the former justice minister, Nouradini Piri. Sanction would ban Mr. Said and his allies from traveling to the bloc and would see their EU assets frozen. The families accused the Tunisian government of arresting, torturing, and in some cases killing those deemed to be in opposition. The EU has previously condemned Tunis, but conditions have since worsened. A similar request for sanctions has been submitted to the British Foreign Secretary. We head over to South Africa and the former head of South Africa's national energy firm, ESCOM, has refused to name the minister and politician who allegedly tolerated its corruption, Andre de uh, Ruita, who was answering lawmakers' questions by video link due to death threats against him, cited security and legal risks. A couple of months ago, after de, uh, de Ruta alleged someone tried to poison him by putting cyanide in his coffee at his office, he engaged in an interview with a local news channel. His appearance Wednesday before Parliament's Standing Committee on Public Accounts stems from what he revealed then about the level of corruption in ESCOM. De Ruta told the committee in an affidavit this week that in his estimation the company loses about 54 million uh, US dollars per month to corruption. He called that number a conservative estimate. That means it could go up in the upwards and based on losses that came to his attention. Despite being offered a parliamentary privilege on Wednesday, De Ruita wasn't willing to name the politician he alleges is involved in the craft for nor the government minister he claims tolerates it. However, he did not object or correct his statement from Alf Lees, a member of parliament representing the main opposition Democratic Alliance, and um, uh, yes, uh, Pravin Gordon, uh, who was the minister then, is the Minister of the Public Enterprises under which ESCOM falls. Gordon has previously admitted to having a conversation with De Ruita about criminality and the power company, but has denied saying corruption should be tolerated. When pressed Wednesday, De Ruita said Gordon knew the name of the political politician involved. Okay. And then we end by heading back to the DRC. At least 60 bodies were discovered in several villages in the Democratic Republic of Congo's North Kivu province. Authorities confirmed on Wednesday residents of Kashali and Kazaroho villages in the Choro territory were killed over several days by rebels or from the M23 group, said Isaac Kibera, a deputy to the governor of the Buito area. The M23 rebel group, largely made up of Congolese ethnic Tutsis, rose to prominence 10 years ago when its fighters seized Goma, eastern Congo's largest city, on the border with Rwanda. It derives its name from a March 23, 2009 peace deal, which it accuses the Congo government of not implementing the rebel group was dormant for nearly a decade before resurfacing more than a year ago. The M23 fighters are accused of civilians, are accused by civilians and rights groups of killing civilians and abducting people earlier this month, the group withdrew from much of the territory that it had captured as part of a ceasefire agreement, but residents say they are still very much so present. Conflict has been simmering in eastern DRC for decades, where more than 120 armed groups are fighting in the region, mostly land and control of mines with valuable minerals, while some groups are trying to protect their communities. In addition to increasing M23 violence, Kodeko rebels in neighboring Ituri province have also been intensifying attacks. On Tuesday, 19 people were killed by Kodeko in Irumu territory, said Gili Gotabo, the president of the Irumi civil society group fighting between Kodeko, a loose association of various ethnic Lendu militia groups, and Zaire, a 
a mainly ethnic Hima self-defense group, has been ongoing since 2017 but has worsened recently. In February, at least 32 civilians were killed by the group. In December, the United Nations said the insurgent group was expanding its areas of control, attacking civilians and Congo's military, and taxing communities in the areas that it holds. And that is the latest news update from across the continent of Africa. Well, another 60 people or 60 bodies were recovered uh, there in the DRC. Okay. Now, this ESCOM story, this person that was supposed to be giving his uh, testimony, De Ruita, <laughs> because he worked for ESCOM, the former head of South Africa's National Energy ESCOM. Uh, he says there is a powerful minister and a politician who allegedly tolerated its corruption because, you know, ESCOM, the, the main power uh, body in, uh, in South Africa, we know South Africa has become worse. You know, it has become worse in, in power cuts. They have a name for it. So they've embraced it. So sometimes they get electricity up to maybe five, five hours a day. So there's a lot of rationing. Uh, they, they have a name for it. I can't remember exactly how they call it. But that is something that has become very problematic and it, to some extent very shameful. Just uh, a few weeks ago, President Cyril Ramaphosa was considering declaring electricity blackouts as a national disaster. And I thought, wow, for the only country in Africa, I think, that brags of being able to produce nuclear, uh, you know, you know the nuclear weapon, the nuclear. I mean, there are countries that run through this nuclear, and you really don't have people with enough brains to see how you can use this resource to address the issue of power. Really, South Africa, as big as you are, as a, the powerhouse that you are, with all these bragging rights, the only country in Africa that has hosted the World, World Cup and all these wonderful things and the level of development <laughs> that is in your country. You cannot provide electricity to your people. You really don't have people in that country that can come up with innovative ways of tapping into the solar energy and this other wind energy. We have some here in Kenya that really helps in uh, uh, in, in, in producing and, and, you know, supplying Kenyans with power. You really can't do that. This is a joke. This is a complete joke. And South Africa has become the joke of the rest of the continent. Of course, followed by Nigeria. I used to think Nigeria is worse. But South Africa has just become terrible in terms of power. And they've been unable to solve that problem. And much of the issues that surround ESCOM has to do with corruption. Corruption that has permeated in the ruling party and through the politicians and the people who have been in power and corruption through the leadership of this institution. So this person used to head ESCOM. Now he could not appear in person in this parliamentary committee to give his testimony over perhaps what it has riddled or what has uh, brought problems to ESCOM because he fears for his life. The last time he had an, in, an interview over the same, he's saying he, he got poisoned and he almost died. So he's so fearful for his life that he was in an undisclosed location while appearing before the lawmakers through Zoom, I guess, to give his testimony. The mafia activities that goes on in South Africa. And if you're told you've taken your time to watch that, that gold mafia that was done on Zimbabwe and a lot of characters that uh, came from South Africa, then you'll know, now you'll understand why South Africa is not even, you know, Johannesburg and these other cities were named as one of the world's most dangerous cities or towns to even live in or to walk around because it is crazy. So if somebody is so fearful of their life that they cannot take a chance to appear before a parliamentary committee where their security is assured, and he's so scared that he can't even name the name of this politician. If I was him, I would just name this politician so that it's out there. And so if anything happens to me, 
then you know who is responsible. I think if he wanted to protect himself, he would just name, he'll just name this person. Uh, but by him withholding this name, I think he has a target, he has a chip on his shoulder, and now he, they, he, they have a reason to go after him and even murder him to silence him forever so that he doesn't get to speak. But when, or maybe he's also trying to be, not to withhold the names and to use them as leverage and to use them to threaten. So if you even dare, then I will expose you. So I don't know his reasons, but I think he's so scared that he can't even name the names of this politician. He said a politician and a, a minister who have tolerated and who have aided and who have benefited from the corruption that is bringing down ESCOM. And if this does not, uh, Malema does not go out in the streets <laughs> because of this, then Malema, you're not doing your job. I know he led a, a demonstration a few months ago, forget the one that happened about a month ago, a few months, over these um, power issues. I think they should put pl uh, uh, pressure because I think South Africa is capable of producing its own power. South Africans should not be suffering to this magnitude, surely. This is unacceptable and pressure has been put, must be put. And if the government and the people responsible cannot really address this matter, then why do they need to be there? If you cannot find solutions, that you are, that's why you're elected. You're elected to solve the problems of the people, at least. To act and like you can find solutions to the things that people would like for you to find solutions, to offer solutions for. Get people who know what they're doing and put them at ESCOM. Get experts. If, you know, if you, there's none in South Africa, I mean, you wanted to sponsor Hotspur, Tottenham. You can get an, an expert who can come to the country and help you with this mess because this is unacceptable. And now, to learn that it's through corruption, of course we've known this for a long time, that is causing all these problems. And the people who are responsible uh, they can't even be named these are the mafia that are holding in fact that is economic sabotage is it that is an economic sabotage what is happening in the power sector in south africa so president Cyril ramaphosa you can't just sit there and and hope that things will work out and you can't you can't keep firing and hiring people the same 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 people who there's nothing much they can bring in terms of the change and what is required to be enforced at ESCOM to ensure that it runs and it serves the people of South Africa. So I think, I, I don't know, but De Ruita should name these politicians, should name the minister and should name the politician. But I guess he's too scared, too scared that he can't even show up for a, a, a parliamentary committee because of his life. It's, it's, it's threatened. That is so scary. South Africa is just something else. Now, there has been some progress. I know our attention has shifted to Sudan over what is happening, and I think it's important because I think what is happening there requires all our attention so that we get to know what's really going on there. But also there is a conflict that we have been following for you for quite a while now, and that is what has been going on at, uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, there seems to be some a bit of progress that is being made as far as the uh, M23 withdrawing from the areas it had occupied in the eastern part of uh, DRC. And this is according to the East African Community Regional Force Commander, Major General uh, Jeff Nyaga. He's saying there is some progress that is being made and the team is pleased with the positive progress. Okay, the M23 is withdrawing back and moving from these areas. But again, when you, uh, uh, the residents from this area, when they're being interviewed by, say, the media, they say, no, those guys are still lagging here. They're, they're still in and within us here, so they've not left. So. I, I don't know which, which ones to believe. What EAC, uh, EAC uh, the East Africa Community Regional Force is saying or what the residents are saying. But according to this force, uh, the M23 are moving back. Uh, just last week, they had, they're still demanding to have a talk with the, uh, the DSC government. 
But uh, President Felix Chisikedi reiterated his position and the position of the government that he has no intentions to open up any kind of dialogue with the M20, M23 rebels. And so that, of course, is... Uh, is problematic, so he's not willing to do that, and he will not do that. Uh, you remember this M23, they are made up of um, the local Tutsi community in the DRC, and because of a lot of many other reasons, of course, stemming back from the Rwanda's 1994 genocide and the what they allege to be a systematic um, marginalization or unfair targeted. Uh, no, uh, targeted attacks or whatever to this community in the DSC. So they feel the need to come and protect their community and fight for their position and perhaps make their voices heard. And maybe they, uh, through the support and delegations that the Rwandan government is supporting them. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's a lot, uh, but uh, this has been a protracted war. So by them withdrawing, and not being able to speak to President Felix Chesekedi. I don't know, we've not, we've not had a solution yet. So this is just a, a problem that has just, is just posed. But I'm sure soon there can be a resurgence of more attacks uh, in this region. So, But from what we're being told, I think maybe we can just go with the report of the East Africa Community Regional Force, is that uh, progress is being made and uh, it is on the positive, it is a positive progress. Um, the M23 are, are drawing back uh, from these positions that they had occupied illegally there in the eastern part of the DRC. But even with that, I think the deaths that also have been reported in the same region also being perpetrated by other groups like Kodeko and other smaller rebel groups. I think also that is on the rise. So it's a lot of uh, aspects of insecurity ongoing there in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but that is the latest um, report from there. Now back to Sudan. Back to Sudan. And uh, of course, South Sudan so far has received about 10,000 civilians displaced by the ongoing conflict from Sudan. So as fragile as South Sudan is, and remember a lot of South Sudan's uh, civilians had uh, gone into Sudan because of the insecurity and instability that has been ongoing in South Sudan itself. And now majority of these people who had gone to Sudan are now coming back to South Sudan, uh, but over 10,000 of them. And of course, in this, uh, among these numbers are also nationalities from Kenya, from Uganda, Eritrea, and Somalia. And so... Uh, that is happening there. So he, 24 Kenyan nationals arrived in South Sudan and they were evacuated to Juba after they, are, they are arrived from the Paloch airport in the Upper Nile state. So they were taken to Juba and I think they should be coming uh, home very, very soon. And so I even as the rest of the countries continue to evacuate their civilians uh, from um from Sudan. So this issue of some rebels uh, taking hold or seizing this Sudan lab, this is very, very dangerous and from these warnings that World Health Organization has been giving from Tuesday. Yesterday, the World Health Organization said that it was assessing the threat posed to public health. And w where, where this lab is, this public lab, I think it's the, the leading public lab uh, in Sudan, they're saying they've kept pathogens, samples of pathogens, including those of measles, tuberculosis, cholera, polio, SARS, the COV, which causes COVID-19 disease. So in, in short, this is not a place that anybody that should not be having access should be accessing. And the potential that of, and the consequences that can, can come out of this lab if something is mishandled can be catastrophic. So I don't know if it is the RSF, I think, could be, must be the RSF, that have, gotten, that have seized this lab. I think somebody needs to talk to them because we are, we are just reading out of COVID-19. So if 
they make another mistake and then the rest of us have to suffer the consequence and even for them they're really risking their lives uh, you know from for being in this place like how do you go to a laboratory what what makes you think it's a good idea to go and 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 seize a laboratory surely this these army officials really so somebody needs to speak some sense to these generals I guess that the RSF that have seized this laboratory because this is not the place they're supposed to be going. And if anything happens, something gets mishandled, then that is another uh, warfare. You know the biological, you know the biological warfare. We do have the physical armed warfare and then we do have the biological warfare and this is the kind. So this can be very catastrophic in a way that is unimaginable. So I'm just hoping that somebody will speak some sense into these people who have seized this laboratory and then they can be told to go find some other place to shield themselves. So maybe they feel that, you know, them being at the lab, of course, because of the dangers, uh, maybe the army will not attack or the other side will not attack uh, because of uh, the consequences the environmental consequences and other and otherwise and health consequences that might follow uh, because of that so uh, i don't know and of course sudan's army and the paramilitary force continue to battle uh, i think um, i was just reading through another ceasefire even the one that was issued <laughs> on monday in the wee hours of monday has not even held and so there were some battles in the outskirts of khartoum undermining a truce in their 11-day conflict. But the army is expressing its willingness to extend the ceasefire. The army late on Wednesday said its leader, General Abdul Fattah al-Buran, gave initial approval to a plan to extend the truce for another 72 hours. How do you extend a truce for another 72 hours while you couldn't even hold that other one for five hours? You violated it. You, you're supposed to extend if I first all this one worked. What are you extending? You've been fighting. You've been fighting. Just declare another truce and then violate it again in the next few hours. You can't extend something that never even took place. What are you extending? So now he's saying he's willing to extend the truce for, for another 72 hours and send an army envoy to the South Sudan capital, Juba, for talks. You know, South, uh, not South Africa. South Sudan has been the one leading mediation, initially between the government and some rebel group holdouts uh, in Darfur and other areas in Sudan. And South Sudan seems to have done, seemed to have done a, a great job. But I think this feud between these two generals maybe was just too much for South Sudan because how could President Salva Kiir talk to them about you getting along and working together and leading the country while well, he can do that with Riek Mashar, who is also another general over there. So I guess he, the, he couldn't get his, his hands on that, on the feud between these two generals, but he's been trying to mediate between uh, the, the South Sudan's government, between the government of Sudan and the other rebel groups, not the two military leaders. And those talks seem to have been going on very well. And so I can understand uh, why uh, you know South Sudan should perhaps come in and and continue with this um, uh, with this mediation, and I think they will be happening in South Sudan uh, from what I'm uh, we are reading, and General Fatah Al Buran is uh, ready, and uh, he will, he said he will give his approval to some of the military, the, the generals who he will send to Juba, to uh, engage in any kind of mediation. I don't know if the mediation have been announced. Oh yeah, the, uh, the EGAD, is it the EGAD of African, the EGAD uh, appointed Kenya President um, William Bruto and Djibouti's President Gulie and also which other president? There are three. I'm forgetting the other one, what a shame. They're supposed to be going to uh, South Sudan, I guess South Sudan, is it? So they're supposed to be going to South Sudan. I guess that is where they shall be going because it's very impossible for them to go to 
uh, to Sudan itself uh, because of the obvious reasons. Uh, it is an active conflict zone, so it's not safe when everybody else is trying to get out there. We can't have these heads of state head over for any kind of mediation, so they will be going to uh, South Sudan, and uh, I think that should happen soon. So the army is saying it's willing to uh, approve a few of its uh, uh, generals to attend that mediation and represent the army. And uh, hopefully this uh, paramilitary group, RSF, will do the same uh, so that they're able to talk out this issue and see if we can have a, a headway as quickly as possible. The military said the presidents of South Sudan, Kenya and Djibouti worked on a proposal that includes extending the truce and talks between the two forces. So as much as these three heads of states that were picked by IGAD to mediate and spearhead this process. They have not been able to travel to Sudan physically and um, uh, start this mediation process, but they have been working uh, behind the scenes. They have been working on a strategy and a proposal and perhaps uh, just uh, working on the pre, you know, before the, the actual mediation process takes place in conflict resolution. There has to be some pre-preparations and so that you map out everything that is required and what perhaps areas you're going to explore even you know as the mediation continues the process is dynamic so you know things will also come up during this but there has to be initial some things that you have to prepare first before you get on to uh, the mediation. So they have been working on that, uh, these leaders of, from South Sudan, Kenya and Djibouti, and they have been just mapping everything that perhaps is required and areas they need to look at while they're having these talks. And so according to the military in Sudan, they're saying these three heads of states have been working on the proposal, and this includes extending the truce and the talks between the two forces. And... Uh, see the way forward so i'm just hoping that uh, this should happen as soon as possible they should go to south sudan as soon as possible i think they've taken too much time they would have gone to south sudan a long time ago i uh, you know i know they're still waiting and working and whatever but i think as it is right now we need for them to start this process as soon as yesterday so that we can have this at least the cessation of hostilities stop for right now, as they work through issues, unless this, you know, the, 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 the killing stop, then, you know, it's, it's just complicating matters. So if you can have this mediation uh, process start right now so that we can reach a quick uh, agreement, uh, you know, a preliminary agreement of a cessation of hostilities and create an environment that allows for a proper mediation, as then we are wasting so much time. It's really too much time. Uh, it's 10 days later, you know, 11 to 12 days later. So we need for these leaders to go to South Sudan. Now that they're not going to Sudan, they should be already in South Sudan and have talks there. Did I have a... Yes, I did. Uh, Kagame is in Tanzania. Kagame is in Tanzania meeting President Suluhu. It's another interesting story, but I'll not talk about that right now. I'll perhaps get into the details later on in the uh, 3 p.m. show. But I think the leaders in these three countries, what I was saying is should start with this mediation process quickly and see if they can get a hold of these generals. The army has said it's willing to uh, push RSF and see if they could uh, prepare their people. They meet in South Sudan and have conversations there and see how they can broker at least an agreement initial. Uh, for a cessation of hostilities as they work through the rest of the issues and uh, the matters uh, that needs to be mediated in this process. I don't know. The president of South Sudan, the president of Kenya, Djibouti, I don't know. Maybe South, you know what, we wish them well and we'll see how they will handle this process. Personally, I'm, think, I'm very much invested because I really want to see how they conduct this uh, mediation and how much progress and results they're able to, to come out with. And, you know, let's, let's have some confidence in them. All right, thank you so much for your time this morning. I'll see you later, 3 p.m. East African time. For more news from across the continent of Africa, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.
Thank you.